Hello, 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 everybody. This is the Bituation Room. I am your host, Francesca Fiorentini. That's that's the kind of week it feels like it's been. Uh, I'm glad I'm here to add more noise to your week. No, no, no. We're going to clarify a lot of things. We've got such a good show in the next hour. So buckle up, sit tight. Grab your beverage. We're talking about the economy. We're going to blow your minds about the deficit, what you don't understand but should, uh, with Professor Stephanie Kelton, who's going to be here a little later on. Obviously, we're going to be going into what's going on in Israel-Palestine and all the shenanigans slash human rights crimes that are taking place. Um, And yes, uh, I'm going to be bringing in my good friend, Nato Green, for that discussion, uh, as well as a look at um, CDC guidelines. We're going to have some fun, so everybody sit tight and make sure you got your your new CDC guidelines. What are they? Let's talk about them. Um, But I want to just recognize that this episode is a very special, a very, very special, because it is the one year anniversary of the Bituation Room podcast live stream. We started streaming a year ago tomorrow, which is insane. We started off discussing. We had Veronica Huerta, I think her last name is. I'm I hope that's correct. Um who was, who works as a virologist and she was doing a bunch of testing, early COVID testing. And back then it was like, when are we going to leave our homes? What's going on? I was complaining that I had fridge in the, in the food in the fridge and Nada was making fun of me and it was a whole thing. And you know, um, it's been a, a fucking year since that day we started. So Um, I'm really, really happy that you guys have all been here. I'm really happy to have your support. Uh, I'm so happy that you guys have been donating. And, and I remember early on, we were raising money for different food banks and different causes. We've been through the BLM movement, obviously, uh, that is ongoing. Um, but it's been quite a ride and I'm just so thankful for everyone who's become a subscriber, who's, uh, been here on Twitch and on YouTube, who's listened out there in the ether and given good, you know, five-star reviews. And if you haven't do that shit right now. Um, and yeah, if you are not a patron, Hey, now is a great time. Patreon.com slash bituation room, uh, become a patron. You get early access to the bonus episodes, which by the way, will be coming at you on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to talk to uh, a Palestinian human rights lawyer, Nora Erekat, um, who is just wonderful and who you might have seen before, but we're going to talk for a good long while all about what's going on in Israel-Palestine. So don't you worry. There's going to be more coverage of that from yours truly. But Thank you so much, you guys. Thanks for for tipping TBR-Live on Venmo, TBR-Live on Cash App, for remembering that this show is blood, sweat, and tears of some w- lovely, lovely people and and, and mostly me. No. <laughs> but no, but the, like, I'm really happy to share this space with you and, and with everyone who's been on this podcast. Just thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and because of that, it is, of course, time to look back at this week and thank all of the people who became patrons, who've tipped, who have become subscribers on Twitch. It is time for the fart song. Uh, 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 uh. Thank you to Dylan N, who just became part of the Franny Pack. 20 bucks or more. Send me your question for the AMA. Thank you to Jesus, to Damon D, to Theodore C for upping your pledge to $10, which gets you this shout out right now. Um, thank you to the big tippers, Joseph L. Man, you are so, so that. Uh, Win K, Edgar C, James J, Zachary P, Sarah W, as always, Anwar P, thank you guys so much for the new Twitch subs, uh, Mew Growl Grizzle, Flatulence, this is your song, bro, this is your song, um, Ra Trash, thank you, and Go Invest, thank you so much, you guys can become Twitch subscribers, just use your Amazon Prime dollars, if you have them, you can easily be a Twitch subscriber there that you get like uh, ad free content and you support the show and 
you know, it's a little bit of a like F you to Jeff Bezos, but not really, but kind of, but anyway, whatevs. It means a lot. Thank you guys so much. And hey, thank you on YouTube to Todd Roy and Chuck Diesel holding it down as always remembering or reminding people to like and share and subscribe this stream. You guys are the best. Love you. Um, and thanks for being here. Uh, I hope, I hope that as we open up, you guys remember that there is value to not leaving your house, you know, that like people in society generally overrated, generally, not always, but mostly. Uh, so thank you for being here once again on a Sunday. And with that, I'm going to say uh, and talk about what I am complaining about on this Sunday evening. This is what are you bitching about? And of course, in the vein of uh, of things opening up, uh, this this has been a week where the CDC made a pretty surprising 180 after like two months ago being like, we're all going to die. Hold your loved ones close. Now, in what I think is sort of a like bizarre um, reverse psychology ploy to get anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers to either get vaccinated or wear a mask. Um, the CDC's new guidelines say that if you're fully vaccinated, you do not have to wear a mask indoors. Okay, great. And I know that sounds like a relief. At the same time, it also sounds like we're setting ourselves up after huge success with a vaccine rollout for massive failure. Because even though millions and millions of people have been vaccinated, only about 36% of Americans are fully vaccinated right now. Right. And so once again, this feels a little bit like we're calling it quits before we should be that we're kind of throwing in the towel or like, it, you know, typical mission accomplished America. Just throw a banner on it. Let's do it. When like maybe we should be waiting another month, you know, maybe Biden just rolled out his new like plan to get people vaccinated by going to communities, by working with health professionals and community leaders. Like we just reported on that last week on this podcast. And now already it's like, no, you know what? We're not, we're not going to do the masks indoors. Okay. So as a refresher, um, and as a reminder, uh, We've had some trouble with wearing masks, and I'm not so sure if the Kevins and the Karens, who were so insistent that they would not be wearing masks indoors, are going to be so eager to get vaccinated. Um, and you know that many places are not instituting any kind of vaccination, passport, or checked policy that is actually not part of the CDC's guidelines. Once again, they're leaving it to individuals, uh, and mostly minimum wage workers at Walmart and or Costco. So because of this news, places like Costco, places like Trader Joe's, they all drop their mask mandates for indoor shopping. Um, but of course, states and counties and different cities all have their own particular mask mandates themselves. So Everything's a little bit out of sync here. And I want to just play for you a video that explains and shows exactly how out of sync. This is from California. Um, this is former child star Ricky Schroeder, uh, who I had to look up. I was like, who, who the F has heard of the champ? I haven't. Uh, I guess he was in that movie as a very blonde child. Uh, this guy, a uh, real stand-up guy, he donated to the Kyle Rittenhouse Fund for... Um, you know, white supremacy. Uh, this is him harassing a Costco employee uh, for asking him to wear a mask before shopping. Why aren't you letting me in? Because in the state of California, in the county of Los Angeles, there has been no, and Costco, there has been no change yes, to our mask policy. Not in the state of California or in the county didn't of Didn't you see the news? Angeles. You didn't see the news. Nationwide, na nationwide Costco yes. has said you don't wear, need to wear a mask. Actually, that's not accurate. What, what is accurate? So what is accurate is that Costco always goes above and beyond when following the law. And the mandate in California has not changed. There does seem to be the possibility that in June, by mid-June, that's a date that California I know oh, if is they allow at. us, if they, if they grant us that, our kings. Oh, the, the, the kings and queens who, like, run this ship? 
My God, I love Americans really want to live in tyranny and monarchy. Like, we have it so good. We have it so good. Costco is a beautiful place. Put on the goddamn mask and go get your goddamn snacks, you washed up racist. But anyway, um, it's not just me. You guys are thinking like, well, Francesca doesn't know what the fuck she's talking about. You're right. I don't. Touche. But I will say that the fact that workers are consistently on the front lines of whatever kind of enforcement or guidelines, because by the way, Costco did say you don't have to wear masks, but the state of California does. So the guy's not wrong like a genuine company man. But I just want to bring up this tweet. This is by uh, this is from the president of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Mark Perone, who says that um, millions of Americans are doing the right thing and getting vaccinated, but essential workers are still forced to play mask police for shoppers who are unvaccinated and refuse to follow local COVID safety measures. Absolutely. Once again, how many how many like how many workers have we seen just like facing down nut jobs at the front lines of their supposed hero heroic work? Speaking of heroes, the National Nurses Union also came out and said that they were not in favor of the CDC guidelines dropping masks for indoor for people indoors either. Even if you're fully vaccinated, uh, this is a tweet from the president of the National Nurses uh, United. Am I not bringing that up? Uh, they st- they state a continued high number of COVID cases in the U.S., circulation of COVID variants, uh, a concern, and unanswered questions about the vaccines. These are just a few of the concerns nurses have with new CDC government guidelines. Uh, and then the president says, or the executive director says, the newest CDC guidance is not based on science, does not protect public health, and threatens the lives of patients, nurses, and other frontline workers across the country. Cool. So that's where nurses stand, you know, the ones who've been saving our asses and our families and who've been going to work day in and day out. That's where workers stand, the people who we've heralded as being heroic. And this whole this is just Biden's ploy. I mean, this is a ploy. It's a ploy to be like, get your vaccine, guys, because then you didn't take off your mask. Once again, These folks have no problem lying to your face. They have no problem like exposing you to any kind of new variants. They have no problem with that because they they don't care. They've shown from the beginning that they do not care. The other thing, and I have to double check this, but apparently the CDC is not going to be tracking COVID cases of people who've been vaccinated. What? That's from the National Nurses Union. That's uh, National Nurses United said this and they have a problem with that. I had no idea that was going on either. So, like, look, Bill Maher has COVID, and I hope he gets well very, very soon and can continue to do his show day in and day out. Um, But I I realize that me crossing my fingers for the podcast listeners means nothing. Uh, No, I fucking hate Bill Maher. Uh, Replace his show with this one. Thank you, HBO. Um, But I do think we should be tracking these cases. It is important. Anyway, y'all. That's my bitch. You bring it to me in the comments. Bring it to me wherever you want. What are you guys bitching about? Uh, I think we can do better than this. I think we dropped mask mandates way too soon. We should have continued them for at least another few weeks, maybe until middle of June. July 4th was when Biden said he wanted to have everybody, you know, gathered and families for July 4th, blah, blah, blah. Cool. Then stick to that, man. Stick to it because it was way too soon. And I don't trust these fools at all all. And with that, my wonderful guest on this one year anniversary of the Bituation Room was there from the beginning. He's been there. He's been making his drinks. He's a comedian and a union organizer himself whose series Laughter Against the Machine can be found on Means TV. His comedy albums, which you definitely need to listen to now, uh, are the Whiteness Album and the NATO Green Party. And they're both available on Bandcamp and everywhere else you get ear content. Um, He is criminally unverified on Twitter at Nato Green. Please welcome Nato Green. Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, You know, it's really shocking that Ricky Schroeder, who got famous for playing a spoiled rich kid uh, (laughs) as a child actor, ended up being a spoiled rich kid. That's that's pretty shocking. but we do owe him a debt of gratitude. Um, I don't. I, this is before your time, Francesca. But 
we have that show to thank for the fact that you know who Jason Bateman is. That's oh. the show that launched, sort of launched Jason Bateman. Was he it, as blonde as Ricky Schroeder? Because I you no, want you. He was not, uh, not at all. Every once in a while, there was a very. I, I I was a fan. I watched Silver Spoons mostly for Jason Bateman. Uh, there was there were some very special episodes. So he was cute even as a kid. Is that what you're trying to say to me? Is that how old was he? Is this Jason, is this above Jason board? Bateman? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. I mean, you know, I am of the generation where, like, I really identified with. Are you? Do you have a drinking problem? I do. You know, I actually do have a drinking problem. I just yeah. drink water poorly. Everybody. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Ba I'm bad at it. For people who are listening to the podcast, uh, Francesca started pouring water into her mouth before it reached the place, and then just poured it on her face. So here's. Do you want to know what I'm bitching about? What NATO? Let me tell you. Uh, did you know that Pinterest is subversive? Um, so my, I didn't realize this, but I was talking to one of my kids, my kids, I have seventh graders, and one of my kids just today was like, D uh, do you, daddy, did you know that Jesus was a black Jew? And I was like, y yes, w where did you learn that? <laughs> and she was like, the internet and I was like what were you searching for that that was the thing that came up and she was like I was just browsing on Pinterest and so and then <laughs> and then like the other day a few days ago she was like daddy um you know uh public schools were invented to uh train children to be good industrial workers in factories and to condition to uh young working class young people to respond to the bell on command and I was like what where the fuck did you learn that and she was like Pinterest <laughs> and so then I was like, "You could, what pin? What like commie Pinterest?" I know. I was like, "Dude, what is going like? Like I just use Pinterest, like if at all, to like look at antique furniture or whatever." Uh, yeah. And you know, uh, and coupe glasses for my cocktails and whatnot. That's what Pinterest and I was like, is for. Where is where is woke? Show me your show me your Pinterest. So she pulls out her Pinterest, and she and like we're surfing through it, and because it's my kid, it's like a bunch of like cute animal memes and sure. then they'll be like you know and then like subversive feminist memes just like mixed into it you know so apparently <laughs> there's like insurgent pinterest out there that that nobody was aware of except for 12 year olds it's like otters and antifa together yeah exactly like that, that's like my those are like my search terms just yeah, like cute, right. cute otters smashing the state right together <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So you're bitching about the fact that you didn't know Pinterest was like woke AF. Yeah, and... I, I'm. I'm just bitching about that. That like my kids are on some subversive shit, <laughs> like in some like corners of the internet that I can't track. Uh, <laughs> and so now, I, now I'm like, oh my god, I've got to pay attention to. I got to pay attention to. Uh, um, to Pinterest. To their boards. To their boards. Not That's to follow really my adorable. kids on Pinterest. Yeah. Oh, well, we we have to get into this week, and I obviously the the biggest news uh, I think we all know is what's going on in Israel Palestine, and uh, I'm so glad we have NATO to talk about this. Um, and but but first, just in case you were living under because a I'm a Jew and I can I can say the anti-Semitic parts pretty so much. To, yeah, I just I I'll defer to NATO, yeah. and that's because Israelis yeah. are. No. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's good to have a Jew around to be like, you know, break glass in case of Jew talk. Uh, <laughs> just like an emergency Jew to be like, oh, we're talking about Israel Palestine. Tense. Emergency Jew is an the emergency funniest. Jew break glass. Emergency, stop. Get over here. You agree, right? Yes. Um, uh, no, but other things that happened this week. Uh, uh, Liz Cheney ousted from Republican leadership. Good riddance. I guess and Matt Gates appeared to have been doing lines with an Instagram model slash weed dealer slash wing woman for teenage girls. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene yelled at AOC in the halls of Congress because apparently that's how legislating works. Um, Ellen DeGeneres revealed she will be ending her show, maybe not soon enough. Uh, hackers out of Russia stopped an entire pipeline in the United States. The colonial pipeline was stopped with ransomware, leaving gas prices around the East Coast soaring um, because the company couldn't figure out how to bill people. Not because they couldn't figure out how to get people gas, just so you remember. Um, and a Bitcoin billionaire donated a billion in crypto to India's COVID relief. Uh, India, spend it now. Now. Or I don't know which... 
do something with it that you're not doing. I don't, I'm not sure what to do with it. Uh, and finally, Benefer, guys. Benefer is back together because nobody can resist a an aging man who loves Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, it's all about Ben Affleck. But for everything else, this is the week where. So as promised, this was the week where uh, violence against the Palestinian people in the West Bank continued and has spread to Gaza with an aerial bombardment that Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, shows no sign of stopping. At least 192 people, including 58 children and 34 women, have been killed in the Gaza Strip in the past week. More than 1,200 others have been wounded. Uh, in the West Bank, Israeli forces have killed at least 13 Palestinians. Meanwhile, rockets fired from from Gaza, from Hamas, have killed 10 Israelis. Uh, the recent round of violence started with a violent expulsion of residents in East Jerusalem's neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah, um, land that Israeli settlers are claiming is theirs. And then, of course, there's the repression at the Al-Aqsa Mosque that I think a lot of people um, saw. I wanted to just play this one little clip of a vice journalist who caught on camera a an Israeli soldier about to throw a flashbang at an emergency worker uh, at a and and journalists literally journalists and medics so you can you, see you, there are emergency service workers here there's an ambulance there uh, there are journalists here we go look at this here we go oh he just told him not to throw <laughs> you can see it they saw the camera and didn't throw so there you can see in his hands So, right, that is outside of Al-Aqsa Mosque. That's around May 6th. So that was early in this. And it's basically like uh, an, an IDF soldier, like uh, 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 about to throw a stun grenade right up uh, next to an ambulance that's already attending to people and then doesn't because he's being filmed. Um, by the way, that same journalist, Hind Hassan, uh, wrote this on Twitter. It's seven days, now eight days, actually, as of this recording, since Israel began bombing Gaza. And for seven days, the Israeli crossing into the Strip has been closed, blocking humanitarians, medics, and journalists from entering. Residential areas were pounded earlier this morning, and civilians remain buried, both dead and alive, under the rubble. Obviously, there's far worse videos to show than the one that I showed of a, an IDF soldier almost throwing a flashbang grenade at an ambulance. I don't really feel like showing all of the horrific videos. I think we, we've we seen them, and uh, if not now, in 2014 and 2009 and every other goddamn year that this happens. Um, but it is important if to remember. now, when, though? Really? Exactly. If not now, when, as the as the awesome uh, anti-Zionist Jewish organization says. Um, but it's been it's been devastating. And NATO, look, uh, I found a bright side. I found a bright side in all of this, um, which is that this is a sign that Israel's vaccination campaign is working. OK, because some of us, we get vaxxed and we go back to eating out or some of us go back to hugging friends. Americans go back to mass shootings and the IDF goes back to ethnic cleansing. You know, it is the old normal. And that means something's working. That's literally the only silver lining I could find. Um, <laughs> obviously, if you guys didn't see this, I'll let you know that Israel also bombed the headquarters of Associated Press and Al Jazeera, uh, giving everyone inside of that building an hour to evacuate and claiming that Hamas was operating out of the building. And for everyone saying that it's bad to target journalists, to be fair, Hamas is using the truth as a human shield. So <laughs> just everyone needs to remember that part. <sighs> uh, yesterday, uh, there were protests all over the world in in solidarity. And, and it's really an incredible moment. I mean, what... You know, the um, I have been part of the anti-Zionist Jewish left for many years, and I feel like it's, it's sort of moving to the mainstream in some ways. Like the, uh, you know, the fact that the squad is speaking out critically in Congress and Bernie Sanders is as well is a big change. Like that didn't exist. And so there were these huge protests all over the world uh, in solidarity with the people of Palestine. I went to the one in San Francisco yesterday. Uh, uh, organizers estimate 9,000 people were there. Uh, it was incredible. I brought I brought one of the um, 
And it was fun being there because it was like right in the Mission District, which mm -hmm. if you know San Francisco, there's like the street is packed, like shoulder to shoulder, people there like waving, you know, with shirts that say another Jew against apartheid, uh, you know, Palestine will be free, et cetera. And then there are people trying to get past being like, I'm trying to get to brunch. Like I heard there's a good <laughs> shakshuka over here at that place. Can I get the shakshuka? You know, that like, so that was happening. Um they uh, thought they were in the brunch line. Like, wow. Were, oh yeah, it's gonna be a while till I get a table. <laughs> is this is this for eating in the parklet um outdoors? <laughs> so and the chain like so it's like a real, you know, a, a, like a teachable moment for my kid because I was with I was with my 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 child who's non-binary and uh and we saw somebody holding a sign that said that no to pink washing. And my kid mm. was like, What is pink washing? And I was like, well, let's go ask that person. So we walked over and I said, hi, excuse me, I'm NATO. Uh, this is my child and they're 12 and they're non-binary and they want to know what pinkwashing is. And the person was like a Palestinian activist and was like, oh my God, I'm non-binary too. What's up? Like non-binary solidarity. Hell and then yeah. like gave my kid like uh, like an, an inst instantaneous crash course on homophobia in Israel and Palestine. And, uh, and you know, and it was like a very uh, mind blowing moment for them to like get, learn that on the spot. But then there were some confusing parts, like people were chanting, um, people were chanting, we don't want two states, we want 48. And my mm. kid was like, which was I think referring to the 1948 territory of mm -hmm. Palestine before the creation of the state of Israel. But my kid was like, why do they want 48 states? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, oh, let me unpack this for you. We don't want two states. We want forty-eight. Yeah, they, no, it's that's a that's the right answer. Is like yeah. forty-eight states. It seems like a lot of Let's states. Seems like why don't you start with one and build up from there? <laughs> uh, well, okay. To the point that yes, uh, the squad is speaking out, and this it does feel like a sea change moment. I just you know there was a very valiant statement put out by the White House. I'm sure everyone saw uh, President Biden. Uh, putting out in a tweet today, the president spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, reaffirmed his strong support for Israel's right to defend itself against rocket attacks from Hamas and other terrorist groups in Gaza, and condemned these indiscriminate attacks against Israel. Blah. It's <laughs> it's so it makes me so mad that like that, and there there aren't that many issues like this that people have to like equivocate and condition it so much. Like yes. people can't just be like, you know, it's not. You shouldn't like bomb an entire neighborhood. That's not good. That they have to be like, well, of course Israel has a right to exist, and of course Hamas is a horrible organization. Of course we condemn the rocket attacks. We, of course, we condemn extremists on all sides, and of course everyone is, shares some responsibility. But at least we can. It's like there's like all of this just bullshit that people have to get through to be like, yes. But maybe also, I'm not sure about this. You know what I mean? Like it's it's such mealy mouth liberal garbage. Absolutely. And and it is like I think it is the one place as as someone who's been excited by the progressive, at least proposals, a lot of things haven't passed, but some have. This is where the status quo, Joe, is really showing them true colors, um, which is actually kind of surprising to me, because to be honest with you, Obama's legacy in the Middle East, if you guys remember as much as, you know, a lot of folks Hate Obama will never give him a credit for literally anything. The one shred of credit was that there was a shred of distance between his foreign policy and Israel. And, and he started to step to Israeli settlements. And there was that whole hot mic incident where he was telling the French president Sarkozy that like Netanyahu, oh God, tell me about him. I got to deal with him every day. He's a pain in my ass. Meanwhile, if you guys don't remember this, probably one of the most racist things that ever happened. And I can only chalk it up to just straight disrespect and racism. Netanyahu came to speak to us, to Congress without telling President Barack Obama, like disrespect, hateful, racist, like crap. Like he just, and it, I mean, you guys can go look it up. It was like, that is, it's a huge slap in the face. Um, and very indicative indicative of where Netanyahu stands generally. Um, obviously, we're going to go into this a lot more um, on Tuesday with uh, with Nora Erekat, and I really hope that everybody listens and and watches. And I and like again, like this is not the show that's going to like handhold you through like your 
<laughs> your both sides have a right, et cetera. Or not even nobody says both sides have a right. You're you're like both sides are responsible. It's this complicated. Is, there's a lot of history. There's other people, there's other places to go for that kind of stuff. You know, look, this podcast has been very, very firm from the beginning, from everyone we've had on, from all of the anti-Zionist Jews, from the Palestinians, from where we stand. Like this is not, especially at this point, which is arguably, although there's a glimmer of hope, it's a worse point than it's been. It's both worse and also more hopeful. Let me just play a little bit of why it's more hopeful. I do just want to end on this before we we wrap it up about Israel-Palestine. As NATO said, people in the squad finally speaking out around this issue and not equivocating. And here is Representative Ayanna Presley doing just that. Palestinians are being told the same thing as black folks in America. There is no acceptable form of resistance. We are bearing witness to egregious human rights violations. The pain, trauma, and terror that Palestinians are facing is not just the result of this week's escalation, but the consequence of years of military occupation. In Sheikh Jarrah, the Israeli government is violently dispossessing yet another neighborhood of Palestinian families from homes they have lived in for decades. We cannot stand idly and complicitly by and allow the occupation and oppression of the Palestinian people to continue. We cannot remain silent when our government sends 3.8 billion of military aid to Israel that is used to demolish Palestinian homes, imprison Palestinian children, and displace Palestinian families. A budget is a reflection of our values. I'm committed to ensuring that our government does not fund state violence in any form, anywhere. Mm. So good. So, so, so so good. Oh, gosh. So everyone obviously watch that full speech, but also you can call your electeds as well and demand that we do not funnel three point eight billion dollars a year to Israel. Um, and yeah, there are steps being taken. Look, boycott, divestment, sanctions is a movement that the Palestinian people have asked for the people in solidarity with them around the world take up in terms of taking money out of Israel, out of profiteering on occupation. So Tuesday, we're going to get into it, but let's move on. This is my, <laughs> I am an aunt. I am a, an aunt who is losing her cool, not like her temper, just becoming less cool. And I'm proud of it. Um, we're going to move on to our next story. NATO Green found this gem, and I'm so, so happy that he did. This was the week where uh, a lieutenant colonel in the Space Force, which already I have a lot of questions about what that even entails. But a lieutenant colonel in the Space Force was temporarily removed from his post after going on a conservative podcast and claiming that Marxism is invading the U.S. military. The man in question is Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Lohmeyer, who in fact has an entire book about the Marxist infiltration, as he calls it, of the military. And the book is called uh, Irresistible Revolution. Uh <clears throat> Yeah, Marxism goal, Marxism's goal of conquest and the unmaking of the American military. To be fair, like class war is is pretty hot. So it is fairly irresistible. It's just like mm. I don't know. What's what's more irresistible? It's like a cocktail book on top of a vibrator on top of chili cheese fries. Like that's the level of irresistibility. Yeah. Notice how I said book, not an actual cocktail. Um, is this is this your form of harm reduction? <laughs> I'm just looking. I'm not drinking. Sure. <laughs> um, okay, so he said, let me just give you a little more context. He said uh, he has, the question is, has there been like the Communist Manifesto? Is that being passed around like uh, on bases? Apparently, no. Uh, Lohmeyer told the podcast host that, quote, the diversity, inclusion and equity industry and the trainings we are receiving in the military that are rooted in critical race theory are rooted in Marxism. Um, for translation, for you guys who don't understand what I just said, um, he's mad black women fly planes. It's uh, like the the if you don't know the, there is a diversity equity inclusion thing of like consultants who like like I've had some brushes with it and it's like consultants who get hired by companies to go and give like a corporate TED talk of like you know you shouldn't touch black women's hair 
okay. then people like, but, and then like the white liberals like write that down on a notepad. And then they're like, but what if I want to? And they're like, no, <laughs> don't do that. And then they're like, okay. Um, but then can I ask trans people like what kind of, like if they have a dick or not? Like, no, you, the other people's genitals are not your business. That's the diversity, equity, inclusion uh, industry is the, is like, that's but they as do far it as it in goes. like a sketch and they're like, that's wrong. That's <laughs> right. I yeah, don't know. I'm trying to, uh, psh, uh, psh, uh, psh. Like <laughs> what rhymes with genitalia? I can't, I'm doing bad rap, but that's, it's like a school yeah. assembly, but for people in, in the military. Right. It's like, it's like schoolhouse rocks of, of not, being like needlessly offensive to your coworkers, um, you know, it's they're very focused on you know microaggressions and stuff like that, uh, and so which is fine as far as it goes. But you know what? Not rooted in Marxism, like that's that's quite a that's quite a leap to get there. But I was just marvelled at the sentence: uh, Lieutenant Colonel dismissed from Space Force for going on a podcast and saying that Marxism was infiltrating the military. That is the conservative version of me getting fired by my organic produce CSA for saying on the habituation room that Antifa is being infiltrated by Pantsuit Nation, which is to say <laughs> both of those are things that would be impossible to explain to Karl Marx himself. Like <laughs> when Marx wrote that such a state of things will maintain itself and reproduce itself upon a, co a constantly increasing scale until a new and fundamental revolution in the mode of production should again overturn it and restore the original union in a new historical form in explaining dialectical materialism. He mm -hmm. never would have gotten to space force officer fired on a podcast. <laughs> Give him some time. You know, he might, he might maybe, maybe like all the aliens are communists and like, you know, but but got it right. I I do want to just read. Okay, here I read. I want to read from the book jacket, and then I'll give my final little a bit that I wrote. But uh, this is from the book jacket, you guys. So this is him. This is Lieutenant Colonel whatever the f, f his name is. Um, after becoming aware of the Marxist conquest of American society, you will never again look at things in the same way. Mainstream media, social media, the public education system, including universities, as well as federal agencies, have all become vessels of various schools of thought that are rooted in Marxist ideology. An ideology is my favorite part, bent on the destruction of American history, of Western tradition, specifically Judeo-Christian values, everybody drink. And of patriotism and conservatism. There we go. How more Nazi do you want to get? Judeo-Christian values, our, our heritage, our tradition. By the way, critical race theory is not mark rooted in Marxism. Uh, critical race theory is just looking at race critically. But of course, if you're on the right, even learning about race and racism is racist, uh, especially critically. Uh, the right hates critical race theory. They prefer trivial race theory, like one time a black guy was mean to me, or inconsequential race theory, like Indian food gives me gas. See? Like that's their speed of theory. <laughs> any <laughs> any analysis that involves more sophistication than something that you could easily fit on next door or say shout from a passing truck at an immigrant is too complicated <laughs> for them. <laughs> oh God. I wish him well. Um, if it makes you guys want to feel or feel any worse, this is trending number one on Amazon books in communism and Marxism. Take with that what you will. I feel like it was a self-published job. He's only been temporarily suspended. He's going to have his job back. You guys, don't you worry. For all you little squealers on the internet. That's what I'm calling you. Um, guys, let's move on. We're talking about the economy and how everything you know about it is wrong, dead wrong. And in fact, why we need to have an even bigger deficit. What? Um, you guys, we're going to be welcoming our next guest, but this is The Sitch.
And joining us for the sitch, uh, she's a former chief economist on the U.S. Senate Budget Committee and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. Politico recognized her as one of 50 people across the country most influencing the political debate. And Bloomberg named her one of the 50 people who defined 2019. She was a contributing writer for Bloomberg and her op-eds appear in The New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times. Please welcome Dr. Stephanie Kelton. Thanks for having me. Stephanie, what's going on? Oh, I immediately called you by your first name instead Good. of. <laughs> do. Please do. <laughs> um, Professor. Professor Kelton, you have also written a book that, that came out right when COVID was hitting um, called The Deficit Myth. And in it, you go into the theory of modern or the modern monetary theory, which is something that you yourself came around to after studying it and looking into it. Um, and I just want to unpack all of those things. Um, but without getting too uh, theoretical, first off, um, you opened the book by talking about this BS question that always happens whenever progressives want to spend any kind of money on infrastructure or healthcare, which is the how will you pay for it? Um, and also this whole talk about the debt. Well, the debt, the national debt and the debt and the debt. But meanwhile, when conservatives want to get a two, a two million tax break to their like homies and the one percent or they trillion. want to start a war. Exactly. Trillion. Excuse me. Two million. Two trillion dollar. Two million trillion. <laughs> um, nobody asks how we pay for it. So what what like break that down? What is fundamentally wrong with the way we talk about the debt? Um First off. Okay. So, well, I would say it a little bit differently. Say, what is wrong with the way that we talk about the government's finances? And the short answer is that we tend to talk about them the way we talk about our own personal finances. So politicians talk to us like that, right? We often hear uh, some politicians say, well, if I you know, we run this country uh, recklessly, it's fiscally irresponsible, any business out there ran their affairs the way the federal government operates, they'd be bankrupt uh, and out of business in no time. Well, sure they would, because there's a fundamental difference between a private business or household and the way that we have to operate our budgets and the way the federal government gets to operate its budget. And the key difference, if we make it as simple as possible, is that the federal government in the United States of America gets to issue the US dollar. Think of them as the, as the currency issuer. And the rest of us stand in a fundamentally different position vis-a-vis -vis the currency. We are currency users. So before I can spend, I gotta come up with the money. I really do have to find the money. I don't get to drive off the car lot with a new car until I first put up the money. A business has to earn profit in order to stay in business. Um, state and local governments, mayors and governors, they really do have to manage their finances carefully. They have to balance their budgets. Federal government is just fundamentally different. And, you know, COVID, if anything revealed that for us over the course of the last year plus, it is coronavirus and the way that Congress sprung into action with, as you said, multi-trillion dollar spending packages, spinning them out left and right with no worry about, you know, where is the money going to come from? Congress mm -hmm. writes a bill, they commit to a certain level of spending. If the votes are there, the money goes out and the money went out to help households to help businesses, to help state and local governments. So the federal government gets to do what the rest of us can't do. It can spend money it does not have. Yeah. It, and yet, is that naturally contributing to our debt? And our debt is like $28 trillion right now. And conservatives constantly warn about it, but it's like, well, what happens when we hit 30? Like, does the stock market turn into a pumpkin? Like what, like it's always like growing and yet the consequences of a large debt are never explained. And somehow we still have money for stuff, <laughs> i.e. a new war. Yeah, so you know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. And when you say <laughs> for a new war, well, there is absolutely always money for tax cuts when the Republicans have uh, the reins of power. And there's always money in the ev event that somebody wants to go to war and the votes are there to do that. So 
Um, I think it's important to distinguish the deficit from the debt because even politicians sometimes conflate these terms. And Lord knows, you know, I teach economics. A lot of my students walk in the door; they don't know what the difference is. So I, let's I, just make I'm it. I'm that student. <laughs> see, all right. So so let's do basics, right? What is this thing we label the deficit? And it has this connotation, right? That it's a shortfall. That when the government engages in deficit spending or runs a deficit, it's mismanaging its finances. It's done something wrong, right? The mm. deficit carries with it that implication. Not true at all. The deficit is the difference between two numbers. That's literally all it is. Difference between two numbers. The first number is how many dollars the government spends into the economy each year. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other number is how many dollars they subtract back out of the economy, mostly through taxation. So when the government's budget is in deficit, it means they are adding more than they are subtracting. They are Got spending it. more than they are taxing back. So using simple numbers, if the government spends 100 into the economy, but only taxes $90 back out, we label it a government deficit. We write a minus 10 on the government ledger. We say, shame on you. Why did you do that? That's a deficit. Shame. Bad. But what we forget to do is recognize if they put 100 in and only take 90 back out, somebody gets 10, right? right. Their deficit The is Jews. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Their, their deficit is actually a financial contribution. It's a deposit yeah. that goes in some other part of the economy. The question is for whom and for what? Every deficit is good for someone. Make no right. mistake about it, right? Because you said about the Republicans with their two trillion, nearly two trillion dollar tax cuts mostly for the rich. Why did they do that? Because they really worry about deficits and they think they're so irresponsible and terrible. No, not at all. They did it because they understand perfectly well that on the other side of their deficit lies a financial windfall for somebody yeah. else. So they did it, right? And that's the deficit. The COVID relief package that the Democrats passed in March was also about a $2 trillion package. Only that deficit directed those dollars to a very different constituency. So they went to help lower income and middle income people. They went to help state and local governments. So every deficit good for someone, right? It's the contribution. The debt is this other thing. So the debt is just the historical record. It's like looking in your rear view mirror and seeing all of the past deficits that have ever been run mm. by the country over the course of time. So in other words, the, the thing we call the national debt are all the dollars that government spent into the economy and didn't tax back, they're mm -hmm. currently being saved in the form of US government treasuries, their bonds, their government securities. And we call it the debt, which I think is really unfortunate. We should just recognize it's part of the broader US money supply, their interest bearing dollars, and they're part of somebody's savings and part of somebody's wealth. Right. Can, can you uh, explain this in terms of Hamilton? <laughs> um uh the yeah the, meaning sing it well no there was a bunch of stuff in hamilton about the national debt um the and and creating the national debt can you, um no my my genuine question is like like when you talk about the ten dollars that goes back that goes into the economy like the economy is not a, a thing that is separate from the government right like that they're they're, they're, they're sort of uh, like a a it circulates and it, it it's fluid. So so my understanding is, again, be my limited understanding, is that there are some things that there's there are people like you who are professors of this stuff who have some sense of like if we you know spend ten dollars on the economy in this way, it's actually good for the economy and the state and every society as a whole. And if we spend ten dollars on the economy this other way, like can you talk some? Uh, can you give some examples about like how those benefits work? Sure. So this is what I meant when I said every deficit is good for someone, but for whom and for what are these deficits being run? So, um, but in a way the government does sit outside, right? Because we're just talking about, think of the government like the scorekeeper for the dollar. 
So when mm -hmm. you go to a sporting event, you know, like a football game or a basketball game or whatever, the, the points show up on the scoreboard, visitors team and the home team, right? And the points are going up and getting added. Maybe they review a play and they decide, you know, the buzzer had gone off and they subtract some points away. The stadium is putting the points up and maybe subtracting them away, but the stadium doesn't have any points. They don't lose points when they assign points. They don't gain points in their bucket when they subtract some away. So the government think of that as like the issuer of the points, right? And it sits outside, but those points are really important to this game of life that we're all playing in this economy. So if the government is running deficits and using deficits to add points to the balance sheets, add dollars, right? To the balance sheets, the wealthiest people in this country who are already doing phenomenally well. That's what Republicans did with their tax cuts. They put a bunch of points on the balance sheets of corporations and of overwhelmingly the wealthiest people in this country. And mm -hmm. those dollars do what? Mostly just accumulate. They invest those dollars in the stock market or companies do buybacks and that sort of thing. So you're asking, you know, does the money go around the economy and change hands and benefit lots of people? Not in that case. But in other cases, if we were investing in the kinds of things that President Biden wants to do, a lot of those things, infrastructure investment and R&D and education, child care, elder care, the Build Back Better agenda, all that, that's the kind of spending that has what economists call a high multiplier. It's going to lead mm. to a lot of additional income and creation, and those dollars are going to change hands, and you're going to get uh, a better performing, growing economy through this sort of multiplier effect. So that dollar is going to benefit a much bigger constituency in the economy as it changes hands and, and boosts economic activity. That makes sense. Uh, can I can I ask? So I confess, Professor Kelton, to being a a, a modern monetary theory skeptic, and uh, just in the sense that, like, you know, like you've seen this stuff about how in the last year that you know there was like so many billions of dollars that were lost by working people and that the wealth of the billionaires increased by that the same amount like the faced with historic inequality the idea that we can you know there's a there i feel like it's it sounds too good to be true that the government can issue more money and we don't have to go get the money from the rich people and take it and redistribute it how do, how does redistribution and issuing more money how are those two things related can i can i just can I just ask that you also like briefly explain what modern monetary theory is? I wanted to show off and explain what I had learned about it. Oh, but, sorry. I'm sorry, buddy. But, no, but I feel, well, fuck you, number one. Um, and But number two, you know, you, yeah, Stephanie, if you can explain sort of what it generally is. And then, yeah, the, I think because NATO's question is kind of like the number one question, which is. Yeah, sure. About taxes and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So we we touched on it pretty much in the beginning when I started off by saying the federal government's budget doesn't work like a household budget. Why is that? Because the federal government's the issuer of the currency and all the rest of us are currency users, right? So if you're the issuer of something, you, you manufacture it. It comes from you and it can't come from anywhere else. The US dollar comes from the US government. The government has the sole legal authority to issue the US dollar, the currency. You and I can't do it, it's called counterfeiting, right? We get busted trying to create US dollars, that's illegal. But the constitution gave unto the federal government the exclusive right to issue our currency, which means what? Means they can never run out of money. Hmm? You never run out of money. When Barack Obama was president, Shortly after he got elected in 2008, we had this huge financial crisis. The economy is spiraling downward. He goes on television and a journalist asks him, at what point do we run out of money? And his response was so unfortunate because he said, we're out of money now. And you know, what we ended up with was a policy response that was way, way, way short of what was needed to support the economy and fully recover and so forth. And Congress lost its nerve. and We didn't get the fiscal support, the spending that would have been necessary. So MMT says, look, let's just recognize the federal government budget is different from a household budget. Government issues the currency, can never run out of money, can pay any debt it has, even the really big ones, is not going to end up like Greece and other European countries that got in lots of trouble in 2010 when they had debts that they could not pay. What was happening in Greece 
Italy, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, this debt crisis that happened over there was that all these countries were borrowing in Euro. They had given up their sovereign currencies. Greece used right. to have the drachma. Now it didn't. It was operating on the Euro and it can't issue the Euro. So it got in trouble. So MMT says, if you have your own currency, you don't borrow in foreign debt. Uh, yeah. you're not promising to convert your currency into something you can run out of, like gold or another country's currency, then you can operate your budget in a way where if you want to commit to spending and the private sector is willing to produce and sell to you, you can afford to buy whatever is for sale and available in your own currency. The limit is inflation. So MMT replaces a fake, phony budget constraint with an inflation constraint. That's what it's about. Yeah. Yeah, that's so what I understood from reading your book and also from what you just said is essentially it is a bit of a privilege of being the hegemon. It's a privilege. You know, I lived for many years in Argentina. Their whole they basically have dollars as like their reserves, which are is inherently unstable for them um, to not kind of save in pesos. Um, their economy has been screwed because of it. Uh, you should go down there. They need your help. Um, and <laughs> but but that also it is a theory that it's okay to add to the to the to the national debt if you're spending the money that you're printing and that you're spending it in those things like infrastructure like healthcare like child care the things that are going to um reap way more benefits for the entire economy as a whole um and that you balance out the idea that there'd be too much that there would be inflation by taxing and raising taxes and so that was the other thing is that actually to balance out from what i understood of your writing that you balance out that the inflation question with maybe taxing the rich too taxing everyone a little bit more but specifically wealthy people okay well let's talk about that okay yeah, so please. so um, a few things there. It, it You're is like, I no, no, no. <laughs> I, yeah, well, I mean, like, yes, no, no, yes, yes, no. Um, <laughs> it's more like it's not just the U.S. And I think it's really important that it's not, you know, the U.S. as a hegemon and people often say, well, OK, you're the reserve currency, so you you can do this. But other countries can't run their budgets like that. Sure, they can. Look at the U.K. You know, mm -hmm. the, the British government is the issuer of the pound. The Australian government is the issuer of the Australian dollar. Canadian government issuer of the Canadian dollar. Jap Japan, Japanese government issues the yen and so on. There are a lot of countries that can manage their budgets, unlike that of a household, the way the U.S. does. Japan has the largest debt to GDP ratio in the entire world, depending wow. on how you count it, some 240% debt to GDP. They've been running budget deficits, big ones for 30 years, three decades, right? They have no inflation to show for it. They have some of the lowest interest rates in the world because their central bank sets interest rates very low. So it's not just the US that can do this kind of thing. Um, and then your other point, what was I going to say about your other taxes? And oh, yeah, yeah, of, that's really yeah. important, too. Mm -hmm. So so look, and this goes to NATO's point earlier, where he said, I'm a skeptic because I, I don't think we can just spend and not raise taxes or something like that. Well, of course we can. We've been doing that for the last 15 months. We started in March of 2020 with the CARES Act, which was $2.2 trillion, no tax increases. Nobody's taxes went up to do $2.2 trillion. And then at the end of the year, in December of last year, we did 900 billion, no tax increases. And in March of this year, Congress did 1.9 trillion, no tax increases. So of course, Congress can write a bill. And if the votes are there, pass a bill that commits to spending without raising taxes. Of course we can. We've been doing nothing else for the last 15 months. The mm -hmm. question is, at what point are the tax increases needed? At what point do they become necessary? Now, you both might take the position that they're needed now, because as I think NATO said, the very richest people in this country have grown inordinately wealthier. Like Their wealth has just increased right through COVID. And, and you say, that's wrong. People shouldn't increase by tens of billions of dollars their wealth in a matter of months during a global pandemic. And we should do something about that. So you hear politicians say, we need a wealth tax. We need you know uh, this tax, that tax to try to deal with these gross inequities in income and wealth distribution. Fine. I'm I'm prepared to go, you know, along with all of that and say let's do something to 
aggressively deal with the income and wealth disparities in this country, here's the problem. The votes aren't there. The votes are not there. Not right now. You do not have the votes. Biden wanted to raise the corporate income tax rate to 28%. The Republicans took it from 35 down to 21. Democrats, Biden administration said we shouldn't be at 21. Let's go to 28. He's not saying let's go all the way back up to 35. Bernie Sanders said let's go all the way back up to 35. But Biden said let's go to 28. The votes aren't there. And it's not just a mansion problem. There are a number of Democrats in the Senate who are yeah. not prepared to go to 28, nor Absolutely. are they prepared to do a wealth tax, nor are they prepared to take the capital gains tax to the ordinary income tax. So, and is that a and is that a problem? Because well, Biden's Biden's argument in a lot of ways, right, even in his speech was, and I'm sure you have a critique of this, was, well, we pay for all of this infrastructure by c creating this tax. You bet I have a critique of it. I just told you what it is. The votes aren't there. <laughs> The no, votes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, right? That's my critique is like, <laughs> uh, because you have to Abolish stop the that. filibuster, goddamn it. You, you, even without the filibuster, you don't have 50 votes. You yeah, do no, not yeah. have Democrats, 50 aren't Democrats even on, in the Senate. Yeah. So at that point, what are you going to do? He wants 4.1 trillion. That's what it adds up to with the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan is 4.1 trillion. You do not have the votes to get 4.1 trillion in tax increases to produce the revenue so that you can say I've paid for, quote unquote, all of my spending. It's fully offset, it won't add to the deficit, it's quote unquote paid for, the votes aren't there. So now you have a choice. If the votes aren't there to get all the revenue, one option is, well, I guess we can't afford 4.1 trillion. So you start chopping down the spending proposals, whittling it all down, so that you end up with a much smaller package that helps far fewer people and does far less to support the economy and jobs. And so you say, I have to size it to what I can afford. Or you say, screw it. It doesn't matter. I can still pay for the 4.1 trillion and it'll be offset by whatever revenue I can get the votes for. And the rest of it will be deficit spending, just like all the spending we've been doing for the last 15 months or so. So that's where we are. Right. Because it seems like there's more of a bipartisan appetite to spend versus raise taxes. And That's you're exactly right. Right. And, so, and, and the essentially MMT is the idea that that that's okay for right now, that you don't have to always find find where the money comes from, because and this blew my mind about your book that like taxes actually don't pay for a lot of what the government does. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, you know, it's like a slim, slim amount that taxpayer money actually goes to pay, um, for government function. Uh, maybe I'm like looking at your face be like, am I wrong? Am I it's wrong? It's like <laughs> zero. It pays for state and local government spending, but at the yeah. federal government level, it doesn't pay for any of it. So yeah. it's, it's just really, frustrating and it's really important that more and more um, lawmakers are beginning to think of taxes in this way. Taxes are so important. And you, you know, what we've done is we've linked the tax and the spending. And that's what Biden is trying to do. He's saying, right. I want to pay for every dollar of new spending. I want to take a dollar out of the economy with, with taxes, right? And what MMT has always argued from the very beginning of this project 25 years ago is that we should decouple these things. They're not inextricably linked. We can do the left foot forward and the right foot can stay in place until we're able to move both feet, right? Right now, we can't, we don't have the votes to move both forward in lockstep. The votes aren't there. So can you get your spending agenda through even if you can't get all of the revenue? Yes, you can if you can get the votes for the deficit spending. And what you just said is is exactly correct. And House leaders uh, are saying they have the votes for the spending. They have the votes for all of what Biden wants to do on the spending side. Where right. they have problems is on the pay force. Some House members don't care and aren't interested in trying to match dollar for dollar, every dollar of spending with a dollar of new taxes. Some are of the opinion that that's the very definition of fiscal responsibility and you ought to do it that way. So I'm pretty worried about what what comes, you know, ultimately out of this when you have- Because we can't make that psychological break between spending and the deficit. 
Yeah, that and because we'll be holding ourselves back in a very critical time. Yeah, I mean this this COVID package that Democrats passed without a single Republican vote in March of this year is you know is going to lift half of all the kids in this country out of poverty temporarily. And that's the word that bothers me, right? Temporarily. There are Democrats who want to make these provisions. We're talking about the child tax credit and the expanded uh, earned income tax credit and the expanded ch ta uh, child tax credit. There are Democrats who want to make these things permanent. But the Biden proposal proposes to extend them to 2025, not to make them permanent. Why? Because making them permanent costs more money. So uh, I am worried that if um, if you know, the administration or enough members of Congress are reluctant to move forward without everything being paid for, then, you know, it's just suffering and it's gratuitous suffering because it doesn't yeah. have to be that way. All you have to do is vote to authorize the spending the way we've been doing it. And this economy is, you know, still digging out of a deep hole and we can afford to safely spend more and build up our infrastructure and manufacturing capacity and so forth um, without care. Yeah, their education, healthcare. There are yeah. a lot of things and climate. My God, you know. Um, so it's already inadequate in terms of what the administration is proposing to spend to deal with climate change. The last thing I want to see is for that package to get whittled down even further. I'd rather see it get bigger. Yeah, we had Naomi Klein on the show wow. and she was talking about, you know, sort of the fallacy of private enterprise being the ones to step in around climate change. It's like the only entity that can spend the money required to stop and truly transition off of fossil fuels uh, is the government um, because of its ability, because it isn't, you know, it is keeping score. It can print the money. I have a dumb question, which is, if China holds so many bonds, is that a problem? Are are we all just afraid that they're going to be like, well, time to collect, and then like we're exactly. owned by them? That's like, exactly what right. what is the what? Nope. What's the fear? That's the fear. Knock knock. Who's there? China, <laughs> right? Um, the bill has come due that somehow they're going to turn off the spigot, and no more dollars will come out, and we will be starved of financing and unable to pay our bills. That is the way the story is presented, that we are borrowing from China, that we are, you know, at the mercy of the, the willingness of the rest of the world to lend dollars to us to finance our deficits, absolute baloney. Why on earth would the United States government depend on, be dependent on anyone for access to a currency that it issues? The answer yeah. is it doesn't. China ends up with US treasuries, mostly because China manufactures more goods and services and sells them to us, then we manufacture and sell to them. So as a consequence of our trade deficits with China, we get a bunch of stuff made there and they get dollars in a checking account. They don't want the dollars in the checking account, so they shift them into a savings account called a US Treasury. And that's all that's happening. We so-called borrowing from China is just shifting the dollars from one account under their name to another account. We pay it back, we just shift it back to the first account. It's, mm. it's just really, a non-issue. In fact, China has already reduced the number of treasuries. I think they had about two trillion not that many years ago, and they're down to just over a trillion now. So you could say China has reduced its holding of U.S. treasuries by about fifty percent. Uh, and who noticed? Did, did right. the lights go out? You know, it's these are yeah. just myths and misunderstandings. Ugh. NATO. Why? Uh... Why? 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 Uh, they lie to us. <laughs> well, I mean, who 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 benefits from these myths and misunderstandings? You got it. Um, a lot of people do, but for sure, um, anyone who benefits from austerity, anyone who benefits from unemployment. I mean, think about. I, I'm serious, right? When you think about unemployment, what are some of the ancillary costs of unemployment, crime, prisons, um, you know, the Wall Street benefits, we run yeah. these bonds through the private uh, markets and pretend that we have to borrow from uh, financial markets in order to finance spending. And so there's a little cream off the top and it's not such a little cream, it amounts to hundreds of billions of dollars every year in interest income 
paid to the private sector to run the finances um, in a way that creates the illusion that the government needs to borrow from private markets in order to finance spending. So, I mean, I, gosh, I could probably write a whole paper just going through as I think through who benefits from the current system. It would be uh, a wide, broad group. Well, it's almost like they are treating themselves like the government and they're treating the government like a private citizen. You know, it's like you get into power to then skew the entire economic system in your favor, say that you don't have enough money to pay for, you know, health care or unemployment costs or whatever, you know, all the things that actually help people. And then you're just constantly funneling it to yourself. So private it's like health hey, insurance companies, charter schools, health, like yes. we could just go on and on exactly. and on, right? Exactly. Um, and, and all while, I mean, it's a little funny because it's like, you're like, well, corp uh, corporations are people too. And the government is, all, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to make this work, but it's like treating the government like in a way that it is not like treating it as a powerless entity because you've rendered it powerless. And they do that all the time. But this is specifically through the economy and through the, the use of the debt as a rhetorical device. When we say, when politicians, I shouldn't say we, because I never talk like this. When politicians say, talk about the billionaires and how if we could just peel off, you know, a little bit of what they have each year, just, just enough to feed a hungry kid, fix a crumbling bridge, do this sort of stuff. We center them in our well-being universe. They are at the center. Now we need them. We are dependent on them. We can't act. We can't move forward unless and until we can pass a wealth tax or we can get a financial transactions tax or we can get you know loopholes closed and we can get a corporate tax. We and they've got the power. And so they stop it from happening. Sure. And then we sit back and go, well, that's too bad. I guess we can't afford to do anything because we've centered the billionaire class or whatever as holding the keys to our, you know, economic and social well-being as if, you know, we can't do anything without them. I think we should flex and I think we should flex hard and show them Jeff Bezos may be the richest man in the world, but he got nothing compared to what Uncle Sam can do. You know what I mean? Oh, like, I love this. We we can take care of our people and our communities there, and some, our planet. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, you know, you probably saw the news that 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 in here in California, the state had this unexpected you know, budget windfall yeah. because of because of the wealth accumulation. And there's something perverse that like our ability to pay for the services that working class people desperately depend on. Like we can't that the that our model is set up that we need rich people to be obscenely rich in order to pay for the things that working people need. And so like, so it's like we, 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 we make people super rich and create this insane inequality. And then we get crumbs of that to like mitigate the worst successes of, of the problem that it created instead of like fixing the thing. I mean, it's just, it, it like, whatever yeah, I think about that, totally. it, I, I, I just open a bottle and, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, Don't absolutely. Stop. And, yeah. and you know, you all, you often hear politicians, lots of Democrats talk this way, right? They say the problem with the rich is that they don't pay their fair share. They don't pay their fair share. And if they would pay their fair share, then we could feed that hungry kid. We could fix that crumbling bridge and we could start taking care of our communities and do health care and all this kind of stuff. I think that misdiagnoses the problem. I think the problem with the rich is not they don't pay their fair share because I'll tell you what I think the problem really is. It's that they take more than their fair share. That's why they have so much. And how do they take more than their fair share? It's not just through the tax code, although that's part of it. It's also through patents and protections, right? It's those laws that allow companies to reap, you know, long-term profits mm -hmm. off of patents and protection, government granted, right? It's through labor laws. It's through trade laws that we write. So we have to do what Robert Reich calls pre-distribution. Democrats focus a lot on redistribution. And, and Bob, who's a friend, you know, wrote this book, Saving Capitalism, and he stresses pre-distribution. You get the problem at its root, right? Where it starts instead of trying to chase it on the back end. Once they have it all, then we're running after them trying to take a little bit away. Uh, I think you, I think we, we got to go for, you know, you're taking more than your fair share. That's why workers haven't seen their wages go up. That's why your profits keep rising and so forth. So we should I, organize I more unions. Absolutely. Huge part of this.
I, Stephanie, I don't know if they talk. I'm, I'm also a union organizer. So. Oh, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah. yeah, in California for what? Uh, I, I work for the Service Employees International Union, a, a large local government local. So I deal with local governments across Northern California. Super cool. Yeah. Well, look, Stephanie, I'm excited for the moment where, like Steve Mnuchin's wife, we all get to hold a printed sheet of dollar bills uh, and be like, take that, Bezos. Uh, we're putting this into education. Wouldn't Thank that have been cool if that's how the stimulus came? Like $1,400 oh uh, $1, bills. That would have been really cool. Just give it to like essential <laughs> workers and kids and stuff and just have them hold it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Professor Kelton, Stephanie Kelton. Thank you so much for joining me and, and NATO and everybody, please read the deficit myth. It just came out last year. It's so good. It's so relevant. And my God, if we can break with this thinking and move forward, um, I, I don't know what else is possible. Um, thank you so much for being here. Everybody follow Stephanie on, on Twitter at Stephanie Kelton as well. Uh, and take very good care. Thank you. Thank you both. You too. Take care. All right. NATO, we have one more segment but also some comments. Will you stick around? I know you got to leave pretty soon. Uh, sure. Let's, we can do some comments. Let's do some comments guys. Uh, all right. Um, am I, am I scrolling up or am I just, Oh no, I'm not scrolling. up. <laughs> all right. Sorry. I'm excited. Uh, Tom will 89. Thank you so much. Uh, on vaccines on, on Twitch, you say, I hope there's, there's a surprise reveal that the vaccines did have microchips in them so we can identify the ones who didn't and everyone who got one now gets a dark gun and special goggles to hunt down and trank all the non-vax and vax them from a distance. Your imagination knows no bounds, Tom. Uh, on Israel, uh, Wigwith on YouTube, all the protections on journalists and treaties just being ignored by both the U.S. last summer and Israel like this is uncomforting. Uh, yeah. Uh, Kedge Dragon, uh, $3.8 billion for military aid to Israel, but $2 billion is too much for us, honestly. Uh, on Marxist Roller Dragon on YouTube, you know who also hated hated fascists? Marxists. Very true. Um, Steph on Stephanie and uh, in the N M M T Wooden Monkey God on Twitch says almost like money requires debt. Mm. Damn, bro, you're higher than I am. Um, I, I, I I spent the entire interview with Stephanie trying to see if I could come up with an M M T. T M N T Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle crossover joke. M M N T M M T M N T. But I, oh, like, I like this. I felt like there was some M M T Teenage Mutant Ninja monetary theory type of thing. Well, they definitely I, like, needs, they need a reboot where like they all like Donatello explains it to you, you know, and right, sure. With like Michael, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, we can do there's, this. There's something there, but there's, I just haven't cracked it yet. Yeah. Um, Ralph Tort Good Tort God. <laughs> I'm gonna call you Tort God, bro. Um, on YouTube says economics is engineering. Very true. Absolutely. And it depends on whether you want like a top heavy Titanic or like that boat that like sank immediately, or if you want something that is, you know, more sturdy. Uh Rhino420 on YouTube to reduce deficit is taking money out of the economy. Potentially, but we're also talking about reinvesting in other ways. Um, uh, anywho, I don't get it either, guys, but everybody read the deficit myth. It's good. Um, guys, all right. One last segment for you. Everybody, I want to see your most creative, creative uh, comments here. This is CDC recommendations because the CDC says that now fully vaccinated people don't have to wear their masks indoors and therefore... The jokes are just coming. Uh, one of my favorites from Jane James um, Ponwozik. Pony Wozik. I'm so sorry. Um, he says, huge news. New CDC guidance stipulates that vaccinated people no longer need to maintain a sourdough starter. I feel that. I hear that. Um, so this is new CDC recommendations. All right, I'm going to go first, NATO, and you give me yours and I'll give you one, yeah? Sure. Okay. Uh, new CDC guidelines are in. Fully vaccinated adults are now allowed to double dip their chips, but only once. You just get one. They can't thrice. Double dip, not th triple dip. <laughs> Although mm -hmm. now I, I like triple. 
Uh, new CDC guidelines in, and now fully vaccinated adults are allowed to have threesomes. <laughs> Mine is similar to that. Uh, I You were prevented from four, but that's true. If everyone was like talking about it in the choir, now it's like, let's make it happen. Let's babe. make it happen. Uh, let's get, let's C- get some stranger hookups going. Stranger danger with random keys. Um, new CDC guidelines are in. Fully vaccinated adults are now able to start seeing other people, but only if they have an HBO Max login. There's a there's stipulation with the threesome. Yeah. Um, you go. Uh, <laughs> new new CDC recommendations are in. Fully vaccinated people can uh, <clears throat> can now hug in a creepy way again. <laughs> <laughs> back to back to uncomfortable hugging. Ooh, I don't. You know what? I feel like full hugging is less awkward than side hugging, and I've been doing a lot of like side, like elbow, you know. And I hate those. Like, I'd rather be uncomfortably hugged for too long than to have someone give me an elbow. Mm-hmm. Um, that's for all the stalkers out there listening. You know who you are. Um. New CDC guidelines are in and fully vaccinated pregnant women are allowed one line of cocaine. Just one. Can't hurt the baby. Cannot. CDC says it can't. CDC said. Yeah. Good. (laughs) Um, uh, New CDC guidelines are in and now fully vaccinated people can, um, can shout, uh, at someone who like took their parking place. Oh yeah. You know like I mean? in their face. Yeah. You can get up in their grill and be like, what the fuck, man? I was waiting for that space. And you just like sl- swipe. I'm fully in. vaccinated, bitch. Yeah. I like you're gonna, that. You're going to have to face my rage. <laughs> um, all right. My final one, new CDC guidelines are in fully vaccinated. Adults are now allowed to go to each table at a restaurant and try a bite of everyone's dish before making their decision about what they want to order for dinner. That's mm-hmm. just like, that's not me. That's a CDC. It's a CDC rule. Yeah. Yeah. That's Rochelle Walensky. I think that's what her name is. So take uh-huh. it up with her. But like my mom's hella excited about that new rule, dude. Cause she's, been wanting to do that oh yeah my mom's the lady that rolls up to the restaurant and like goes around every single table and is like what are you eating oh is that good okay oh am i bothering you but i'm so sweet you can't be mad in my face (laughs) does that work for her it does oh my god fantastically yeah uh yeah i'm i it's a it's a source of consternation to my family my my, that i'm that i'm mr talk to strangers the NATO green, the extroverted misanthrope is, is already, <laughs> already ready to ch- chat up already someone in life and them. So much chatting, dude. Uh, I know I love, I'm very excited to have, uh, co- talks with strangers. Um, uh, from the comments, fully vaccinated people can now break the speed of light. Uh, great. CDC says we no longer have to give aid to Israel. Oh, thank God. Um, fully vaccinated people no longer have an excuse not to kiss grandma on the lips, open mouth. Um, <laughs> fully vaccinated people can now use the bathroom without washing their hands. Honestly, they, people were already doing this. Like as soon as it was clear that COVID wasn't transmitted through touching things and through objects, how many like narnar people were like, hell yeah, bro. Well, and also like like now, you know, now that masks are coming off again, what I realize is like ha- like one of the things that wearing a mask for 14 months taught me is how bad my breath can be. Oh. Uh, it, it. And, <laughs> and, and but I didn't care because it was I it was just like me in my own bubble and so I could I could just funk up myself, but now I have to think about my breath, my always smell again. Really? I was more, see, I was more offended by myself. Like I felt like I chewed more gum with masks on. Cause I was like, Oh God, there is someone in here. And it was me. But mm-hmm. like now that I'm not wearing a mask, I'm like, Oh, I'm fine. I'm no one's that close to me. Um, that being said, if you do meet me and my breath does stink, tell me. And if I have something in my teeth, tell me as well. Yeah. Don't be one of those people. Who then like Don't. doesn't doesn't say anything and then goes on Twitter and is like, I met Francesca Fiorentini. She was nice, but man, her breath smelled. Yeah, 
exactly. The, the, and then you add it to like my Wikipedia profile and shit, you know, yeah. like has a piece of spinach in her teeth. Fuck you. Um, you guys, thanks so much for uh, being here. Uh, Nato Green, where can people find uh, your work? Uh, uh, Nato Green on Twitter, Mr. Nato Green on Instagram. Uh, I have two albums out on the uh, best place to get them to support the artists is to get them on Bandcamp. But you can get them wherever comedy can be streamed or downloaded. Sweet. And happy birthday, Nato, for the one year live stream anniversary. Oh, I, thought this, was, I, th- I thought this was. Con- uh, Continuing your running bit of wishing my, me birth, my happy birthday on days that are not my birthday. Oh, oh, no, no, no. But um, but also happy birthday to you as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's not every day you turn 22. So <laughs> <laughs> love you, buddy. Love you Take too. Good Talk care. To you soon. Everybody follow Nato for all of his amazingness. And uh, thank you guys so much for your super chats. You have no idea how much it means. Really, really and truly. The super chats on YouTube. Uh, and the bits on Twitch are like, mm, love them. So Steven Turner, Arthur Ashbrook, Ken M, William Moore, uh, love your paints. Or is that Sherman? I forgot. Uh, Red Lantern 161. Mwah, mwah, mwah. And William says, all these missing votes just show that Congress is choosing gatekeepers for wealth distribution. They keep choosing the 2% over the 98%. Honestly, that's exactly right. Even if they're Democrats, they're like, well, as long as you don't think about the economy differently, um, you're good to go. Uh, Steven Turner says, what is keeping me awake at night is the minutia. Did anyone else hear the Gates say and still president of the Republican states? How very secessionist Mr. Kitty Fiddler. <laughs> First of all, Kitty Fiddler is the best way to describe a pedophile because uh, pedophile is a terrible word. But Kitty Fiddler, I just see like a small cat and like little pa- like ki- puss in boots like doobie doo doobie doo doo. Anywho, um, you're right. Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene. Like, can we start a countdown clock for the love of fucking God? Like, stop them now. Um, and thank you guys to every, all the new Twitch subs. Um, we got Kin of Wolf, subscribe for three months. Rose Alba, 14, subscribe for two months. Dragon My Ass, uh, cheered 100 bits. Thank you so much, Calico Mo, with all your bits. Um, and Calico subscribed. Stone Cold Coder. Why Fire Life 1982 cheered Daisy Dragon. Uh, thank you guys. A depressed progressive subscribe for uh, f- with through Prime. Thank you so much. Uh, don't be depressed. We here. We here together. And thank you, of course, to my producer Becca Roofer, to uh, Ellie Hoffman, to Kelly Carey and to Dorsey Shaw on the other side of YouTube and Twitch and uh, and Twitter and all the things. Follow us on Twitter at Bituation Pod, please, throughout the week. And uh, remember, guys, fight the power, fuck the patriarchy, and don't just bitch about it. Be about it. I love y'all. See you on Tuesday for my discussion on Palestine. Bye.